den 1. april 2013 afholdte Ung Kirke fra Aalborg Citykirke en ungdomskonference for unge i Aalborg. Dagen indbyde på spændende talere, seminarer og godt fællesskab. I dag skal vi se en tale fra gæstetaleren Simon Gibbs, som til daglig er ungdomspræst i Hilsang London. Well, if you got your Bibles tonight, why don't you turn with me to uh, to the book of Luke, and turn with me to the to the to chapter 15, and we are going to go to work in the Word tonight. Are you awake? A little bit more awake than this morning, aren't you? I love those trainers, by the way. I've got a pair of Nike trainers myself coming back into fashion. All of you guys are so cool, you know, you're just so much cooler than everybody in London. I feel like Scandinavians have just got it, you know, they're just, they're cool, they're like really cool without trying, you know, like, I, you know, the hair thing, you know, you've all got great hair, I mean, you don't have to try, it just like plants itself perfectly, you know, the perfect swoop, everybody's got a perfect swoop, everybody's got perfect hair. I wish I had perfect hair. I feel like I'm going to go bald at the age of 30. Kind of sucks for me, but, you know, good for you guys. In fact, nobody's receding in here. How is that possible? You've all got great hair. Anyway, <laughs> wish I was Scandinavian. Luke 15, chapter 15, verses 11. And if you've got your notes with you today, I want to speak to you from the subject, Jesus is the true and better elder brother. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, Jesus is true and better. Turn to your other neighbor and say, neighbor, are you awake? Have you ever been CC'd into, uh, into an email conversation? Uh, CC'd, uh, do you know this term, CC'd? Um, like copied into a, an email. And you've got no idea what's going on in the email. I get a few emails, and emails stress me out sometimes, and I don't know what to do with them all. But emails come through my inbox, and I'm like, okay, wh- what's this about? And I get copied into an email, and I don't even know what's happening in the email. And I'm like, what? Why am I even copied into this email? Like, what's, what's the deal? And it's only when I scroll down the email that I actually find out, oh, okay, I, s- I see what's going on now. I get it because I've got the whole conversation. Now I understand why I'm CC'd into that conversation. And I feel like, I don't know about you, uh, all you spiritual people out there, but for me... Uh, <laughs> I don't always understand what the Bible's trying to say. I, sometimes I struggle what, what Jesus is, is really trying to say in a parable. Sometimes I struggle what's or the context and, and, and what's happening in the Scripture. And so to give you a little bit of context for, for the Scripture that we're about to read, because, you know, it's probably a Scripture, if you've grown up in church, then you've probably heard the parable of the lost son. So it's being dubbed in church, the parable of the lost son. But it is, in fact, actually a parable of two sons and one father. So please don't switch off if you've heard this parable before. But I just want to give a little bit of context before we move on to tonight. So, so to give that context, the sound. So to give that context, we've got this guy, Jesus. And we probably all know, you know Jesus, who he is, who he proclaimed himself to be. He was the so-called son of God. He, 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 he was the man of miracles. Everywhere he went, people were drawn to him. He was, he was attracting the crowds. People were, people were seeing what he was doing, and they were asking him to do miracles and to, and, and, and to speak here and here, and, and, and he was gaining favor with the people. Now, we had in those times what we call Pharisees or tax collectors, sorry, Pharisees or, or Sadducees, they, they were the religious people of the time. They were religious leaders in the Jewish nation of, of Israel. They, they were religious type of people. And they were used to the attention of the people. They, they loved the attention. You know, they had their whole swag on, you know, with their little... They, they, they just drew the attention of the people. 
But, but now this guy, Jesus, comes along, and he's got better swag than the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And the people are drawn to Jesus and his teaching. And the Pharisees don't like this. They just, they're not into this idea. And so they begin to criticize Jesus. They, they begin to say, well, 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 if, well, if you really were the son of God, then, then you wouldn't be hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. The son of God, he, he wouldn't act like that if the Messiah was really here. They begin to question his authenticity and his authority as the so-called son of God. They begin to question him, criticize him. And so Jesus responds to their questioning and their criticism with three stories. I love how Jesus speaks. You know, he doesn't just give like a one-line answer. He's like, gives stories, you know. He gives three stories. Can you imagine like you responding to someone who criticizing you with three stories? That would trip me out. But he responds with three stories. Now, the first story, most of us would probably know it. I mentioned it earlier today. It was about a, a shepherd who had a hundred sheep. Now, the story goes is that one of those sheep goes missing. It goes, goes wandering for whatever reason. And for whatever that reason was, the shepherd leaves the 99 sheep, goes after that one sheep, brings that sheep back into the fold, and celebrates by throwing the biggest party that you've ever seen farmers throw. The second story is about a woman who, who has 10 coins in a little old house. She loses one coin. One of those coins goes missing for some reason. And, and she, she turns herself upside down. She, she picks up the bed. She's looking under the mattress. She's sweeping. She's, she's searching for this one lost coin. She finally finds this one lost coin in her house. And she throws the biggest house party that you have ever seen in your life. She invites all of her friends around. And she's bumping and jamming because she has found her lost coin. And she's so excited about it. And then we come to the parable of two sons and one father. And this is where we pick it up. And I'm going to read this to you. So, so follow with me in your Bibles. It says, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The youngest son told his father, I want my share of your inheritance before you die. So the father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, his youngest son packed all of his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted his money in wild living. About that time, his money ran out in great famine, swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding looked good to him, but nobody gave him anything. So when he finally came to his senses, have you ever come to your senses before? He said to himself, at home... Even the hired servants had food enough to spare, and here I am dying, dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. He's preparing his acceptance speech. So he returned home to his father, and all the while he was still a long way off. His father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, kissed him, and he said, son to his, his, his son said to his father, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worth you being called your son. He's trying to blurt out his acceptance speech. But, but his father said to his servants, Quick, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the fattened calf that we'd been fattening. For we must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead, and he's now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party, someone say party. Party, party began. <laughs> Meanwhile, the, younger, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music. He heard Jay-Z, and people were dancing in his house. And he's like, yo, he's like, what? He's like, what is going on in my house? Why is there Jay? Why are people dancing in my house? One of the servants said to him, well, listen, your, your, your brother is back. He was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf, the baby one, that we, we are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry, and he wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, All these years I have slaved for you, and never once have you refused to do a single thing you told me to. Exaggeration. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when the son of yours comes back after squandering your money and your, on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. His father said to him, Look, dear son. You have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has now come back to life. He was lost, but now 
he has found. Father, we commit tonight to you, Lord. We give it up to you, Father. We, we say, take center stage, Jesus, tonight. And I just pray, Lord, that, that you would use my words, that you would help me to articulate and say what, what you would have me to say, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you that we can party in your church. In Jesus' name, that everybody said, amen. amen. You're full of faith tonight. You're expecting for the word of God. Have you ever, ha, have you ever liked to finish first place? I don't know about you, but, but I like first place. I was around at a friend's place the other day, and um, we were having a bit of a house gathering or a house warming. And so we invited a few friends around, and, and it was, you know, we were a bunch of good friends, and we all came around, and, and we were all having a good time. You know, the, the music was on in the background, and the candles were out on the bottles, and, 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 and we had people making pizza in the kitchen, and, and we had people, you know, drinking juice, and, and just chatting on the couch, and having a fantastic time, just, just chilling, just relaxing, just getting to know each other. And then somebody says out of the blue, hey... How about we play a game of Pictionary? And it was like, okay, uh, that's cool. Let's, let's, let's get out the Pictionary board. You ever played Pictionary before? I'm telling you, it is the wildest, most competitive game you could ever play in your life. We got the board out. There's something that transpires in a room like that. When you get out a board game, everything changes. I mean, the mood goes from calm, smooth, collected, to all hell breaking loose. Have you ever experienced that? So we separate the teams. It's boys versus the girls. The all-time rivalry, competition at its fullest. The boys are you know, wanting to get the girls, and the girls are just wanting to get at the guys, you know, and so we start the board game, and all hell breaks loose. Have you ever experienced that when two or three minutes ago, you're all fine, and you're all cool with each other, and then the next two minutes, you're like, hey, you're, you're yelling at each other, and you're like, you're cheating, you can't do that, you, that's not right, you, uh, how can you do that, you're wrong, um, and you start cussing each other, and you start arguing with each other, and you get frustrated with one another, because it's all about first place. I'm not in this to come second, I'm not losing to you ladies, I'm in this for first place. There is something about first place. It comes really naturally to us, doesn't it? It's natural to the human condition to want to place ourselves first. Would you agree? Look at a baby. I've got nothing, uh, I've got nothing against babies. I mean, I like babies and all, but uh, I'm not keen on having one anytime soon. But... Uh, Babies, they don't care about you, do they? They sit there crying. All they care about is themselves. They don't care whether you've had a good day or a bad day. They don't care whether you have to wipe them or do whatever. All they care about is themselves. See, the selfish nature is revealed at the very beginnings of life. Humanity has this propensity and this inclination towards selfishness and putting self at the top of the food chain. Would you agree? And we find this propensity, this inclination, this, this nature in both sons tonight. We find this in the younger brother. The younger brother, one day, out of the blue, he comes before his father and he says, Get me my money. He wants his money. And in a bold power play of defiance and rebellion, he says, get me my money. And in those days, what the father would have probably had to have done is he would have 
had to have sold up one third of all that he owned to gather one third of what he had to give to his younger, younger son so that he could go off and squander it all on wild living and prostitutes and fake friends and all of the rest. This younger brother, he seeks independence out from the father's authority through this bold power play of defiance and rebellion. And I'm sure we all know people who could fit into that picture of how life works out sometimes. And he begins to find himself in this pit in his life. And he's in this pit and he, he begins to gather together this acceptance speech. And he's, he, he's in this pit. All he wants is, is to get back to his father's, father's household. And, um, and, and we see this beautiful picture take place. He, he gets himself up out of, out of all the bacon that he's been rolling in. And he begins to get home to his father. Now his father had been waiting at the end of the driveway. Day after day, week after week, month after month. The Bible doesn't tell us actually how long he had been waiting. But the Bible does tell us that he had been waiting. And that he had been looking to the horizon day after day, month after month. Year after year, potentially, searching, longing for his lost son, that son who had defied him in a bold power play of rebellion. He was waiting at the end of a driveway for his son to come home to him that day. Son's coming home, and as he sees his son come over the horizon, he girds up his loins, and he begins to run to that lost son. And he begins to get to his son and he throws his arms around his son. And, 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 and remember, he was speaking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And what's really interesting here for us to note is, is, is that Pharisees, Sadducees, teachers of the law, patriarchal fathers in the day that we're talking about, in the context that, that we're looking at, they didn't run. In fact, they would have been shocked in, in hearing that this patriarchal father, this man, was running toward this lost son because they didn't run. It was not kosher. It didn't happen. They didn't run. Little boys ran, but, but patriarchal fathers, they didn't run. And so this father abandons cultural tradition and he runs to this lost son that he sees coming. He puts his arms around him and this lost son begins to blurt out his expect, acceptance speech. But the father shuts him off and he calls his servants and he says, come, come, put a robe on him. Now what's interesting about putting a robe on him is that the son would have smelt of bacon and mud and dirt and he, and he smells of a bad past, doesn't he? He smells of past failure. And his father puts a robe around him, a robe which represents righteousness, which covers the bad smell of his past mistakes and his past failures. And then he says, quick, quick, put a ring on his finger. Now, what a ring represented in those days was authority and resource. This father reinstates his son back into the resource of himself into his authority. Ephesians 2 verse 6 says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. And thirdly, he says, he sees his feet and he sees that his son is barefoot. Now, also what's interesting for us to note uh, in context with this story is, is that sons had sandals, yet, yet the servants of the day, they walked around barefoot. So if you had no sandals, you were seen to be a servant. But if you had sandals, then you were seen to be a son. So his father says, get some sandals and put them on his feet and reinstates him back as a son. And Ephesians chapter 1 verses 5 says, he, it, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Christ Jesus in accordance with his pleasure and will. And this younger son, comes in, comes back after all the past mistakes and all the past failures of, of what he's done and is accepted by the irrational, matchless, scandalous love 
of his father. And he comes to know what it is to be reinstated. Did you know that you have three gifts today? That God has for you this Easter, today. God has for you righteousness that will wipe away the mess and the bad smell of your past failures and hurt. He has a ring for your finger, which represents authority and resource. You have that in Christ Jesus. And you are a son and a daughter in Christ Jesus. He has three gifts for you today that you can freely accept and embrace for yourself today. You see, what I love about this story, about the younger brother, is the fact that this older father, he comes running, which tells me that if you take one step towards the father, he'll come running to you. You see, his love is towards you. His grace is towards you. His goodness is for you. And it's pursuing you. He's after you. You take one step towards him, and he'll come running. Now, if we turn our attention to the elder brother in our story, he suffers a similar dysfunction as the, old, as the younger brother. He, too, was, was born into a state of sin. He, too, was um, born into a state where, where he is in a natural disposition where he is separated and disconnected from God. But, 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 but you see here, the younger brother, he disconnects himself from his father, and he seeks his own independence from a, from a bold power play of, of defiance and rebellion, as I've already said. But what we see with the elder brother is that he stays close to his father. Notice that he says, I haven't even done anything wrong. All these years, I've slaved for you, and I've done everything that you've ever asked me to do. You see, the, the elder brother he stays close and, and he doesn't put a foot wrong. But the elder brother is really a picture of the Pharisee. The self-righteous religious leader of the day. You see, just like the Pharisee and the, and the religious leader of the day, the, the, the elder brother, which I believe this story is really about, the elder brother, he is fastidiously obedient to the father. He stays close. He, he, he seeks a different kind of independence. When the younger brother comes home, the elder brother's angry. He doesn't like it that this younger brother who had rejected his father and sought independence for himself is so freely accepted and embraced by his father. And this elder brother that we find here, who is really supposedly self righteous and he's doing pretty good for himself, he actually ends up being the one who's outside of the party. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever read that story and thought, I wonder why? the guy who seemingly did everything wrong ends up in the party and the guy who seemingly did everything right ends up outside of the party. You see, because this party for us in this scripture is really a picture of the, of the wedding lamb of the supper, the party at the end of the age when Jesus comes back. And this younger brother He's in on this. But the elder brother, he's left out of it. I wonder why that is. You see, the elder brother, he, he wasn't left out of the party because of his, because of his, his uh, he, he, he was left out of the party because of his goodness. He was left out of the party because of his self-righteousness. See, it wasn't his goodness that kept him from being in the party, but it, was, it, was his, it wasn't his sins that left him out of the party, rather, let me say. And it wasn't his, uh, 
his wrongdoing that kept him out of the party, but it was his pride in his own moral record. And it was his pride in his self-righteousness that, that actually left him out of the party that day. Have you ever considered whether your goodness is actually keeping you from God as opposed to bringing you closer to God? Have you ever wondered why, why Christians, why some Christians go missing in action, M-I-A? They seemingly are doing fantastic in church life and, and, and they're serving and they're contributing and they're giving and they're, and they're all about church life and they're, and they're about people and all of this type of stuff and things are going great to them until they hit a crisis in their life and they maybe fall to a, a temptation or a sin because they've developed a do-good, get-good mentality in their life. The moment that they maybe stumble or take a trip, it's all too hard to work my way back to where I was, so why bother? It's all too hard. And way too often, Christian, I believe that we have a complex on the inside of us. We have this do good, get good complex on the inside of us that ultimately holds us back from embracing all that God has for us. You see, we have this complex which says, God, don't worry about it. I'm going to sort this one out. I got this. Don't worry. I, 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 I know I stumbled. I know I fell over. I know I stuffed up here, but I'm going to sort it out. Don't worry. I'm going to get myself right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to make sure that I, that I get back and I, and I start doing Bible reading again, and then, I, and then I start praying again, and then I start coming to church again, and then I'll be right for you. And then I'll, I'll work my way up so that I'm actually, I, I can be righteous enough to actually embrace all that you have for me. And we develop these complexes within our Christianity but this is not the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus did good so that you can have good. The gospel is not do good, get good. The gospel is not, okay, now I have to work out my salvation. Now I have to start praying more. I have to start reading my Bible more. I have to start going to church more before I can come to Jesus. No, the, the gospel is despite of your past failures, despite of your past mistakes, despite of your sin, you need to come to Jesus. He did good so that you can have good. And it's so undeserved. It's unearned. There's nothing that you can do to somehow deserve the gift of God. Even if you were to obey the law to the letter, still, the Bible says, all of our righteous acts are as filthy rags in God's sight. There is nothing that you can do to earn this gift. And we somehow think as Christians, we get saved by grace, we receive all that he has for us, and then we somehow think that we're going to work all of this out by ourselves and we forget to include God on what is going on in our lives and we forget to say I'm not perfect and Jesus I recognize I'm not perfect I need your help in my life I need you to act I need you to move in my life I need you to help me with this issue I need you to help me with this failure I know I stumbled I know I've fallen, but Jesus, I need you. I, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to move. I, I need you in my life to help me work this out. Have you ever seen Mozart or Amadeus, rather? Anybody ever seen that movie? Well, you need to see it if you haven't seen it because it's not quite as good as The Notebook, but it is quite a good movie. We have two characters in this movie. Mozart, who's this crazy kind of like guy who's engaged yet, he's doing all this crazy stuff and he's sleeping around and doing whatever. And then we have this guy called Salieri. Salieri. Say that name. Salieri. Salieri. 
And these two, these, two, these two guys are a picture of what we're talking about tonight. Mozart is a picture of the younger brother who's a bit crazy. And Salieri is a picture of the elder brother who's self-righteous, who's religious, who seeks independence a different way to the younger brother. And they both start life, and Salieri becomes a famous composer in his own right, and he does very well for himself. And at the very beginning of his life, let me, let me read you this. This is what he says. He says, Lord, make me a great composer. Let me celebrate your glory through music and be celebrated myself, which seems kind of odd in itself. But anyway, he says, make me famous through the world, dear God. Make me immortal. After I die, let people speak my name forever for what I love and wrote. In return, I vow in return. Now listen, in return, in return. I will give you my chastity, my industry, my deepest humility every hour of my life, and I will help you, my fellow man, all that I can. Amen and amen. Salieri, as I said, begins this great career for himself. He does really well. But he got something very, very wrong at the very start of his life. You see, he begins with a prayer where he says, if you give me good, then I will do good. It's a wrong mentality. He says, if you give me, then I will give you. See, everything about Jesus Christ is the opposite. Jesus said, you've got to come to me. You've got to give me your life. And this is what I give you. I will give you the gift of salvation. It's the wrong way around. He's got to do good, get good mentality. And, and, and then along comes this guy, Mozart. Who actually, who actually is a very talented composer, and we've all heard about Mozart before, haven't we? We've never heard of Salieri before. We've all heard of Mozart. Mozart was the most talented musician, whatever. I don't know how talented he was, but he was very talented. We all, we all know him, is what I'm trying to say. But Mozart comes along, and he's this crazy guy. He's living, he's living like a nutter, yet he's doing, he's doing far greater things than Salieri was at the time. And so Salieri, he hits this crisis in his life. He said at the very start of his life, he said, God, if you give me, then, 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 then I'll give you. But along comes this guy who's, who's just living crazy, and, and he's seemingly being elevated to the top. And Salieri begins to develop this, this jealousness and this bitterness in his life. And, and this is what he says at the very end of the movie. He says, it was incomprehensible. Here I was denying all my natural lust in order to deserve God's gift. You hear that tonight? You hear that? Here I was trying to deserve God's gift. And there was Mozart did not indulging in all directions, even though engaged to be married and no rebuke at all. Finally, Salieri says to God, from now on, you and we, you and I are enemies, you and I. Salieri is filled with bitterness and jealousy and anger and thereafter works to destroy Mozart. Three things that you'll find in your life if you begin to develop this self-righteous do good, get good mentality in your life is angerness, bitterness, and jealousy. You see, these, these two brothers are actually much more similar at when they first, than they first appear. You see, as we said at the very start, the younger brother, he, he sought independence from, from his father through a bold power play of independence and defiance, but, but this elder brother, he seeks independence out from his father's authority through a different way. He stays close. He stays, he's self-righteous. He tries to get one up on his father by doing everything that he was supposed to do. Now, if I could have the keys up here. <laughs> and I'm going to close in a minute. Now, remember where we started. If we go right back to the very start of where we, where we came from. Remember, Jesus was faced with the criticism and the questioning of, of the Jewish people, of the religious leaders, of the self-righteous people of the time. Yeah? Stay focused. Jesus was, was questioned. He was, he was criticized. And he responds with three parables. And he, and he says the first parable, he, 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 says, he says this, there's a hundred sheep 
and someone goes looking for, for the lost sheep. Okay, all right. And then, he, and then he begins to tell the story about this woman who, who has 10 coins. One coin goes missing and then, and then someone goes looking for the lost coin. Okay. But I don't know about you, but I find an inconsistency with the last parable that Jesus was talking about. You see, we, here we have two sons and one father. Now, the younger son goes missing. But nobody goes after the son. It's odd, isn't it? Don't you agree? Nobody goes looking for the lost son. And seemingly, the responsibility is laid upon the lost son to come back. Now, the father's love is towards the lost son. He's standing on the edge of the driveway, looking out day after day, week after week, year after year, longing for that lost son to come home. But nobody goes out to look for that lost son son. Now, if I can just propose something to you tonight, it should have been the responsibility of the elder brother to go and look for that lost son. You see, in the time that we're talking about, there was great responsibility associated with the elder brother. It was a position in the, in the patriarchal family which held responsibility they were the inheritance to the whole of that patriarch, which I'm talking about family, okay? They would inherit the, the family, the livestock, all of that stuff. They, they, were, they were second in charge to their father. If we go back to the very beginning of the Bible and in Genesis, we find Cain and Abel. And Cain murders his, his brother Abel. Cain was the elder brother. Now, God comes to Cain. God doesn't come to Adam and Eve. He comes to Cain. And he, and he says, where is your younger brother? And Cain, he says, am I my brother's keeper? God insinuating that he was. If we go a few hundred years later, we find the story of Joseph. Joseph was the younger brother. Now, Joseph got beat up on by his brothers because remember, they were jealous they were bitter. They were angry because of what Joseph, how Joseph was. And so they threw him into a pit, but, and they were going to kill him right there and then. But, but the person who steps into that situation and changes Joseph's life forever is, is not the second eldest brother. It's not the third. It's not, it's not the next up from Joseph. No, it's, it's the elder brother. It's Reuben. Reuben steps into that situation and, and he changes it and he, and, he, and, he, and he intercedes for his younger brother. You see, there was something about the role and the responsibility of the elder brother. And I can't help but think, 2,000 years ago, as Jesus sits on the throne of heaven, quite appropriately Easter, and God looking down at humanity, upon the lost sons of humanity, the picture of the younger brother, Jesus, who can be likened to the true and better elder brother, dusts off his backside from the throne of grace, and he steps up and he says to his father, don't worry, father, I'm going to step into the, the mess and the dysfunction of humanity, and I'm going to go and search for the lost sons. For those who are broken, for those who, who don't know any better, I'm going to step out of all of heaven and, and, and wrap flesh and bones around myself and, and, and seek and save the lost. For that's what Jesus came to do. He came to seek and save the lost. And I can just imagine the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the, the teachers of the law, their, their faces as Jesus begins to tell this story to them. And what he's really saying here is, is, is this is not really about the younger brother. You see, this is not even really about the elder brother, but this is more about me, the story. You see, as he's posed with the criticism and the questioning of religion and self-righteousness, Jesus steps up and he says, oh, but, but I'm better than that. I'm better than your self-righteousness. I'm doing what religion could never do. I'm doing what self-righteousness could never do. 
You see, because I'm all about seeking and saving the lost, those who can't help themselves, the broken, the messy, the, the, the dysfunctional. I'm doing what religion could never, never do through his matchless, irrational, scandalous, all-embracing, all-inviting, all-welcoming grace and love. Jesus comes after the lost sons of humanity, and he's come after you today. Aren't you glad that Jesus did what he did 2,000 years ago? That if it wasn't for Jesus, there's no many rules that you could adhere to. There's, there's no many principles that you could follow to, to get yourself good enough to come before God that there's nothing that you can deserve, that there's nothing, no many uh, things that you can earn or, or, or rules that you can follow to get yourself to God. But Jesus did that thing that nobody else could do. He did that thing that religion could never do for you. So why are you still playing with the idea of religion, Christian? Why are you trying to earn and do good to get good? You see, your greatest challenge in life is not your devotion, it's not your focus, it's not your obedience to rules and regulations. Your greatest challenge is simply receiving the gospel. Could it be that there's a God in heaven whose love is so scandalous, so wide, so vast, so high, so welcoming? so all-inclusive that he wishes that none should perish, that he came and sought the lost sons of humanity, you and I.